we're live. It is Wednesday, August 12th, 2020, 501 p.m. We're a minute late, which I'm blaming on YouTube latency. I have an important announcement to make and Kate has an even more important announcement to make. My important announcement is it is a dog shirt day. And actually not just any dog shirt day. Today is a special dog shirt day wherein I ordered four more dog shirts of different dogs. You have to sit dogs. up a little bit so people can see more than the eyes, Ben. It's okay, whole, hang on. It's a whole wait, shirt. Wait, wait. See, there's a nose yeah, let me, down let there. Me, let me actually <laughs> tilt it down a little bit so that we can get the full dog shirt effect. Um, yes, perfect. There we now go. I'm seeing it. This is amazing. There's... So we're going to have four more dog shirts showing up over the next, uh, we, uh, we just lost our guest. I think he'll come uh, back. I, it's okay. Yeah, he'll come back. Um, okay. Uh, Wait, oh, we he... can hear him. Wait, you can hear you, but we can't see you. Weird. I okay. probably uh, the shirt scared him. Button. He was scared <laughs> off by the shirt. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to, uh, uh, while, while I'm talking, I'm going to bring uh, our guest back. Um, uh, I ordered four more dog shirts. The dog shirts are, uh, going to be, I think, other than in lieu of fun merch, basically my uniform on in lieu of fun. I think all dog, all days will be dog shirt days on in lieu of fun, but that is not the important announcement that we have. That's just an announcement for fan of dog fans of dog shirts, uh, we have an important announcement about today's show from Kate. A genuinely important announcement. It's not, I don't really want to talk, I have to leave the show early, sadly, to conduct an interview at 5.30. And so I would not do this to win Lua Fun normally, but it's kind, of a, it's kind of an important interview for a bunch of stuff I'm working on. And so I'm going to have to tag out around 5.20. Um, and so that is that is the announcement. But Ben, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, it's of dog shirts. I'm interviewing dog shirts. Yeah, who are you interviewing, Kate, at five thirty? Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so we uh, excuse. We're gonna excuse Kate. She will just vanish when she needs to vanish. Um, meanwhile, our guest, speaking of vanishing, <laughs> has vanished. Are you, uh, can you, can, are you there, Elliot? Can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Super weird. We can't see, we can see you, you, however. Here, I'm going to um, try to come back in moment. Yeah, lo log out, log out and come back in. And meanwhile, I will just finish up today's monologue with the observation that we're not allowed to have fun anymore. In lieu of fun, we don't even have Elliot Morris, but we're going to get him in a second. Um, all right, what can we, uh, uh, let's do the introduction of Elliot while he's not here. That way he can't correct any errors that we make. Um, Elliot Morris does The Economist's uh, election forecast. And um, uh, it is one of the models that is, uh, um, uh, uh, tries to simulate the election on a regular basis and um, tries to predict the chances of uh, the different candidates uh, uh, prevailing. Um, as many uh, viewers know, today saw the release of probably the most uh, 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 celebrated model of the election, the 538 model, which is a little bit less optimistic for Joe Biden than Elliot's model, which uh, has about a 90% chance of, um, of Biden prevailing. Um, and so we are going to try to talk through what, uh, what the assumptions are in Elliot's model that, uh, make it more optimistic for Biden than the 538 model. We're going to talk through, there he is. Uh, we're going to talk through uh, um, how models differ, how you do a model of a presidential election. And we're going to front load 
all of Kate's questions since uh, she's going to turn into a pumpkin in about 20 minutes. So, Kate, the floor is yours. Um, so I'm just finding this out. So are you working with Andrew Gelman? Uh, yeah, Gelman and one of his TAs named Merlin also helped out with uh, the design of the model. Yeah. Okay. And like, so um, for those who don't know, Andrew Gelman is one of the most famous kind of statisticians in the country. Um, and I would say one of the most respected um, kind of voices and, and statistics. Um, there was a scandal involving, like I'm in psychology, and so what there was a scandal that was kind of involving Gelman or a couple of years ago around um, his supervision of a PhD student who ended up falsifying all of his research in a study that was published by Science. But that shouldn't like, that was actually just kind of like an unfortunate blowback on on uh, Gelman. Uh, it had like very little to do more. It was more, I would say that it was more kind of a commentary on how the relationships between grad students and their advisors work at the very highest levels of kind of math and science, whereas like there just is very little kind of actual oversight. Um, but anyways, uh, so I'm not like, I'm not like, this isn't like going to be like some huge, like I'm, you know, I'm like against uh, Andrew Gelman. I've long been a fan of his work. Um, how has it been kind of putting this model together? And what were some of the things that you decided um, to include and to not include? And why or why not? Well, in the, well, I like designing models. I mean, I guess that's why I do it. Um, so it's been rewarding. Uh, it's tough, though. We chose to pursue a formerly Bayesian model. Um, and what that means is that we wanted to take into account all the sources of uncertainty in our data. Um, and basically, we decided to code the model in like a really arcane statistical language that's pretty hard to learn. So there was a lear learning curve with developing it. Um, but it, it's been a good and rewarding process. I mean, I mean, the purpose of building a model, I guess, is to um, try to think through uh, what causes an event to happen or, or not to happen. And, um, so that the, since I have a, a background in political science, uh, and specifically in, in researching political psychology, why people vote, this was, this was great because uh, you get to apply all of your theories about why and how people vote to a, li a live election forecast. Um, and I think that that yielded a lot of benefit over the traditional well, I, I am hypothesizing that it will end up yielding benefits over um, the traditional election forecasting models. Of course, we can't know until election day happens whether that, that's the case. But it, it allowed us to, I, I think, iterate on the traditional, like, let's aggregate polls and simulate uncertainty in the election with some more nuance. Like, um, we think elections are easier to predict now than they used to be because people are more polarized. And we think that, elect, that, that, that economic uncertainty uh, might lead to a less predictable election because of COVID. So building a model helps you think through all these different uh, factors, and I think a really intellectually rewarding way. Um, and on the upside, like people are interested in what that model produces, um, so we also get to cover the horse race a little bit better than I think uh, the pundits do. So what what are the basic? I mean, you have a giant world of data at your disposal. Um, uh, some good, some bad. What goes into the model? Like, what, what, what does your model consider? Yeah, I actually would push back against the claim that we have a world of data, or at least I would say that that world of data is smaller, I think, than people think it is. So this is actually a pretty hard problem. Um, it's not that you know we have interviews from a million people and we get to leverage all that information, but rather if we're trying to sort out how good or bad economy reflects on the incumbent or how their approval rating predicts what might happen in November, we actually really only have like 20 elections to do that. So statistical terms, we say, are, you know, we have a sample size of 20 and it's hard to learn from that small of data. So, so the world of data that we can actually use to model is pretty small, even though we like to think that we know a lot about how people think and why they vote. Um, but, but aside from that, the model, the model takes into account a lot of data and it controls for this small world. So the first thing we do is to create, um, well, actually there are three steps. The first one is to create a sort of baseline understanding for what's gonna happen in November, right? And so basically that, that requires compiling a bunch of information on elections since 1948. 
saying, uh, okay, if there's a good economy, does uh, the incumbent president do better? Do incumbents get a boost from running relative to an open election? Um, does their approval rating predict or how they'll do in November? Um, and, and we train statistical models to try to solve this puzzle. Um, and, and that gives us a good prior forecast for what's going to happen in November. Um, it, there's a bit more error, I think, in it than people realize. So on election day, it can only predict the national vote with a margin of error of like 12 points. Um, and poll Polls purport to do that with like a margin of error of four. So it's a rough guide early and it's helpful early, but on election day, we're not going to pay too much attention to that. And that's because in the second step of the model, we have a bunch of polling information, both at the national and the state level. Um, and we're going to average it together. Uh, we do so by uh, weighting more polls, or, uh, recent polls higher, uh, and we offer corrections for whether or not uh, those polls are conducted among a sample of all adults or registered voters, which we think probably are biased toward Republicans, sorry, for Democrats by just, you know, a point or two. But it's an important difference to make. Um, uh, polls uh, that are fielded online are also different than those over the phone, which are different than those conducted by robocallers um, or what we call IVR polls. Um, and, and, and then we offer some final corrections for whether or not a pollster is waiting by what we think are the correct variables to wait on. So to ensure that your sample has enough college educated white people in it or, um, or, 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 or non-white, non-college educated people, and whether or not it has a biased sample uh, based on partisanship. So like if it has too many Republicans in it, we can kind of tell in advance and we want to control for that. This last correction, by the way, is something that the other forecasters don't do. So we think it's something that our forecast um, well, again, we're hypothesizing that this will be helpful. We can't really know until November, but it seems to help predict past elections a little bit better. Um, yeah, go on. So I'm really curious. I'm like, so just are, where are you? But where are you? You said like at one point, you, I don't know if you're joking, but you said like a sample size of 20 for like various things. And so you have various layers of this model, and I would actually love it if you could unpack. I know we're all kind of idiots and don't understand exactly how models are built, but it would be so it would be super great to kind of talk about how one goes about building a model from like the very from the ground up. Um, because it is super interesting and layered and, and thoughtful and it builds in some of the questions like Joyce is asking in the comments like how do you predict the turnout of older people who are the most reliable voters like of course any type of mod model would have to eventually kind of take that type of cons like the likelihood of turnout into consideration etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but are you starting like what's your pool to start out with are you starting with mturk data are you starting with something totally different like where are you sorry for those who don't know mturk is mechanical turk which is a, a pool of 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 i don't know how to like put it um a pool of kind of um digital workers that answer questions and can be separated for social experiment for social science experiments um and are like kind of have transformed how social science is conducted because you can like for very little money have a lot of people of various groups and very and can control by size and identity very clearly and run experiments for almost nothing that before would have taken you like years to run across time with like bringing people into a lab. Sorry, sorry to like give that like overview, but go ahead. So I'm not joking when I say this emphasizes 20. Uh, it's actually 18. I was rounding up, um, and that's just because <laughs> we we only have presidential approval rating data for uh, or, or reliable presidential approval data basically since the post-war period. Um, but again, that the insights we glean from that, uh, we don't put a lot of weight on them by election day. We really lean on the polls. But I guess I can talk a little bit about the process of creating a, a model um, with the acknowledgement or the caveat that it's like, once you actually get into it, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot more nuance. Um, but basically what you want to do is like compile a spreadsheet or just like make a T-chart of all of um, the, the in, in our case, the economic growth and the president's approval rating um, in, in every election since 1948. And, and then you also have another variable, which is how the incumbent president did uh, in, in that election. Um, and, and you can imagine if you plot the first two variables, the economy and the president's uh, share of the two party vote uh, you know, on the traditional X, Y grid, you could draw a line through it. Um, and however well that line fits the data, basically is how reliable your model can be. 
uh, and and that's like the fundamentals of uh, of what we call linear regression um, or, or a prediction model. <laughs> um, it gets more complicated when you add more variables. Like you go from a from uh, a, a one a two a one plane or two dimensional chart to like a three or x dimensional chart, whatever. Um, but but fundamentally, all we're doing is like literally charting the relationship between two series of observations. Like you could do this on a piece of paper. Um, I got in a fight once with my statistics professor about why it was called regression. But anyway, <laughs> it, there's not like a good reason. It regresses to the mean. Is I think my it's my is my is my is my fundamental like is my belief. It's like your regret. It's like it's a linear regression to the mean to like the average. I think. But anyways. We could have this conversation offline for those who are not interested in really dorky statistics <laughs> <Maybe we> jokes. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's called regression, to be quite frank. I only know what it is. And, you know, they never, that's something they never teach you in statistics or in my statistics class or like why the things are named the way they are. Uh, but whatever, that's epistemic uncertainty. Um, uh, yeah, but, but again, this process of like learning over the, the recent elections doesn't take up much of our election day prediction. And even right now, it's like it only makes up 30, per, 30 or 40 percent or so. Um, by then, we have a ton of polling data and we actually don't use interviews from MTurk. Uh, we've seen lots of social science research that the type of people who will sit on their couch and uh, do tasks for like a quarter every hour aren't that representative of the population of Americans. They're politically biased um, in unpredictable ways, in fact. So um, typically it's toward Democrats among young people, even more democratic than young people are. Um, but then there are also like weird gender balances once you get higher on the age bracket. But anyway, it's like not reliable data. Um, and we don't think that pollsters who attempt to correct for these things actually can. Um, Imtrickers are also uh, are the ones who take um, survey after survey about politics online are probably also like really politically engaged or have weird attitudes about politics. Like why else would they be doing that for not a lot of money over and over again? Um, so we so said we don't use that. We typically just use uh, the normal live phone or online polls. Online polls are also tricky. Like MTurk data is not great, but it's also unclear where lots of other online pollsters are really getting their data. Um, th there are a few online panels who disclose this, like YouGov, Civics, and Ipsos manage their own panels or get their data from, um, you know, certified vendors and stuff. But but, but there are other pollsters uh, and other companies that take data from all sorts of online online websites that just have curated lists of people they can send questionnaires to. And then they, they think that since they know information about these people, like their demographics and their politics, that they can adjust the data so that it's representative, but it's actually not clear that that's always the case. And the data can be noisy. Um, it used to have a bias toward Democrats, but that might not be the case anymore. So um, uh, I, I, I would really only, I really only trust the high quality online pollsters who like tell you where the data is from and how they're weighting it. Uh, the rest of it's kind of black boxy and it's just sort of hard it's just hard to trust empirically and, you know, with your you know, by common sense, I guess. Okay. I I mean I actually I think that's a great explanation. Um, I would I would kind of I say that we could pivot away from like my really dorky kind of mechanical, like kind of trying to figure out like your trade craft questions. Um, and I'm interested in kind of like what you, what you're excited about the results they're showing and why you're excited about them versus other, by, by your model versus other models. Like, why do you think it, like you've said a little bit why you think it's better kind of in the weeds, but like in terms of results, why do you think that it's like, I guess better in this, in this realm is more accurate. Um, more accurate for future predictions, but also more accurate for currently what's happening? Like what, are, what exactly, like what are you measuring when you measure with this model? Yeah, the, why am I excited about it? Well, like I said, I think we're offering some um, theoretical improvements about voter behavior that other uh, forecasters aren't, aren't delivering. Uh, we really wanted to understand why people made their decisions when we were creating the underlying model for this thing, for the 
uh, for the predicted polling averages that you see over time. And, and most people just see the polling averages and they move on. Um, but but you're right. I mean, accuracy is you're better is determined by how accurate are on election day. So it's it's actually hard for us to know if we're going to be better than the other bottlers. Um, the way we would typically make that claim is by comparing how the model did on the, in the past. But of course, we didn't have a model in 2016, or at least not this model. Um, and our uh, what we call back testing or pretending like we're on November uh, 5th, 2016, or November 7th, I guess, the day before election day in 2016. Um, it's not quite the same because you already sort of know like what's going to happen and that information about how bad the polls were even i guess even though they weren't that bad or like um whether or not uh the economy mattered seep into your model design over time so these sort of back tests aren't super reliable uh at capturing how the model is going to do in the future and like it's helpful it's just not perfect so uh, based on that back testing, we think the model would be competitive. We think it, it'll be just as good, if not better, than what we see from 538. Um, it, it doesn't seem like the New York Times is doing a model this year. Uh, I guess so, someone might end up doing that, um, or, or some of the other minor forecasters. Um, but uh, but yeah, really, we did it uh, because we think that horse race punditry is massively misleading. I, I think we've seen that over the past few months with a rumored surge toward Trump in the polls, even though there haven't been any large events in the media to catalyze such a movement, even though it doesn't seem like he's changed his strategy at all or that the coronavirus is getting that much better. There was a bit of good economic news last week, but um, the way our model looks at the economy is m more long-term to think that uh, average um, growth in the economy over the last year is the best predictor, not over the past two weeks. So like right now we're still in a massive hole. Uh, we're in recession level readings, even though job growth is positive over what it was um, in, in May and April during the worst of the pan pandemic job losses or temp at least temporary job losses. It seems like permanent job losses are even worse now, which again, uh, your model should take into account. Um, but uh, it's it's also just rewarding to see it pr produce reliable predictions every day. Frankly, I mean, it's a it's a massive effort getting all the code to work correctly, and, and so when it does, that's uh, that, that's that's rewarding for myself. Um, and then there are there there's also some utility in comparing the forecasts to the past. So uh, in 2016, we have estimates of how every state leaned toward Clinton or Trump over the course of the election cycle, and we can com compare the predictions now to these sort of faux uh, back-tested predictions from 2016, and, th and that tells you that Joe Biden has a slightly larger lead than Hillary, and I think being able to say that in our journalism is uh, is more indicative, um, or just more, more reliable coverage than saying, Biden's up by you know six on the points. How likely is he to win? Well, if he's up by six and he's doing better than Clinton at her, well, I guess he's up by nine right now, and he's doing better than Clinton at her peak, and he's regaining ground in the swing states, and he might be doing better in Texas, right? You could start to you could start to use the model to tell a more empirical and hopefully a, a mostly objective story about the election. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, and I think. It, it really is just nice to, to see it all working and to see the reception that it gets, frankly. Yeah, congratulations. I have to take off, but I'm really sorry that we don't get to talk more, and hopefully we can catch up at some point. Bye, guys. Have fun, Kate. Thanks. Yeah, have fun. All right. I, I want to dig in on some of the differences between your model and uh, other models, I guess today in particular, the 538 model, both because they uh, released it today, but also because you and Nate Silver have kind of sparred a little bit on Twitter about uh, whose model can beat up whose model. Um, I So I, I want to start with just the empirical question of, you know, what are the differences between these two models that are producing a apparently 20 point difference in likelihood of Biden winning. 
Uh, is that is that an is that an objective? I mean, there 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 must be. You're looking at the same poles, um, because there's only a certain number of poles. Yeah, sure. And there's only fifty states plus the District of Columbia and American Samoa and Puerto Rico, right? So you're not dealing with a different electoral college. So something about the assumptions that the models are making is producing a substantially different likelihood of winning, which is not surprising, actually, because you're different people who make different assumptions. But can, how precisely can you identify what those different assumptions are? Well, to, to highlight the main differences first, and then I guess we can talk about whether or not they are fair to make or um, which ones are more likely to be true or, or false. I guess I would speak in any binary outcomes about the model critiques because we can't know until November. And we may um, not even know in November. Right, that's true. I mean, we could also have another conversation about how we measure forecaster accuracy because if we're giving probabilistic expectations, um, sometimes uh, if there's a, a black swan event, then one forecast might catch it better, but in a, in a normal year, you know, whatever. So, so there are some differences in how. Yeah, uh, but for for the primary differences between our forecasts, there seem to be a few things going on. Um, first and foremost, our forecast uh, makes the statistical assumption based off of the past relationship between polarization and the electorate and variance in presidential election polls or how much they move over time, that in the remaining days before the election, 95% of the time, Joe Biden's margin in the polls should not move by more than about 10 percentage points. In other words, if the race tightens by 10 points and Biden's the suddenly up by or Joe Biden, sorry, Donald Trump is suddenly up by one. You can't tell I've been looking at code all day. Um, then we would say our basically our model was wrong. Like that was uh, an event that on uh, today, August 12th, we would not have predicted. So therefore, something was wrong with the model if that's the case. Um, from from my knowledge uh, of Nate's model, and again, like I only know this from reading the methodology and having quick conversations with him online, he does not make that same statistical assumption or guess. He thinks his model thinks that uh, variance in the remaining days of the election is as likely to be large as it was in 1940 or 1988. Um, I don't think that that's right. Uh, our, our, our electorate today is much more polarized. People change their minds much more, uh, much less frequency, frequently. Um, and, you know, demonstrably, speaking statistically, the standard deviation in election polls now is much smaller than it used to be. Um, this seems like a pretty safe assumption to make on empirical grounds. Now, if you don't want to take it into account, your model will be slightly underconfident. Uh, Again, empirically in predicting 2008, 2012, and 2016, you would have um, been too underconfident in Obama's victories uh, and Clinton's likely victory up until the end of the election, which I guess we can argue about whether or not 2016 was higher variance than we should have thought, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, because the second large difference is um, Nate's doing some things to try to account for the fact that um, there's, there seems, in his analysis, to be more uncertainty uh, in this year than there would normally. Now, of course, like we're in a pandemic, we don't really know how people are going to react to that, besides what they tell us in some limited polling about the issue. Um, so, some, so, so some uncertainty is warranted here. Uh, Nate gets at that by adding another variable to his model to capture the... Um, the uncertainty in the news, the number of news headlines, the severity of those events. Um, if there are more headlines in the New York Times that are that are bigger, I guess, either either in font or in length of words, um, then Nate says that there's more newsy event that's going to move the polls. Now. I'm not sure how he's validated this empirically. We've had this discussion on Twitter, and it seems like, again, you should ask him, but it seems like his rationale is that's a reasonable assumption to make, and even though it only mildly increases the accuracy on his, on his test set, uh, all the elections that have happened before, well, I, all of them, I guess, since uh, 1888. Or actually, that's interesting. I wonder how he gets New York Times calls from 1888, but we can ask him. Um, 
then then we then, then we can make that assumption this time around. Now I have not seen the relationship between these two variables. I don't know how predictive it is. We don't use it in our model, and we get pretty robust predictions for 2016 and going back to 2000 uh, to 1948. Um, so I'm not sure like if we need to be doing that. Um, one thing that we both do but do differently. This is the third thing, uh, is that we increase uncertainty in the model when the economy is very volatile. Uh, because if it's volatile in the first half of the year, it could certainly be volatile in the latter half of the year. Uh, you know, if, if there's a if there's a huge recession, then it's likely that the economy will grow a bit more over the past or, or over the next uh, you know six months, um, because the economy tends to drift toward average growth over time. Um, so you want to take that into account in your forecast uh, because you don't want to be predicting a doomsday scenario at the bottom of a recession. You want to price in the fact that the economy could get better. Um, and, and we do that in different ways. Our forecast, uh, which transforms our reading of the economy to basically be bound between uh, the, the 1929 stock market collapse and the type of growth that we saw in the latter half of the 1980s um, and the 1990s. Um, uh, uh, and, and we trace out the relationship between this bounded or scaled economic variable uh, and, and the uncertainty in the election forecast. Now, again, from reading Nate's methodology, it doesn't seem like he does this sort of transformation. And the reason we do it is because we don't really know what happens when the economy gets cataclysmic. Like, it's probably true that uh, a, a president that's facing a recession as bad as the 2008 collapse will be punished similarly than a president who's facing a collapse that's two times as bad um, because the research into voter behavior seems to indicate that people, that growth, um, or I guess this, in this case a contraction that bad doesn't actually convince extra people that they should vote against the incumbent. Like, you know, once millions of people are losing their jobs and your real disposable income is shrinking by 20%, it's really unclear uh, how many extra people you're going to move. Like, the people who have already moved are going to move. Um, Nate doesn't do this transformation. So uh, uh, a recession that's three or four times as bad as 2008, I think, is going to increase uncertainty in his model by two or three times. And also, that seems to be, to be a bit too much uncertainty. Um, we have found in our back testing that increasing uncertainty in this way and what we call linear extrapolation based off of the volatility of the economy uh, adds too much uncertainty. Now, again, Nate makes the claim that in 2020 it might be good, so we should try it. Um, and it has seemed to work okay for him in the past. But, but again, I'm not sure where he's, where he's getting that because it didn't work for us. Like this is one of the, one of the one things that we wanted to work in our model, but we couldn't make work reliably. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would like, I would like to see the scatter plots for that too. So one follow up on this, uh, Nate said on the 538 podcast today that, um, if he lied to the model, and told it that the date was much closer to actually election day, that the probability of Biden winning would be around 90, 93%, which is to say roughly in line with what you're predicting. Mm. You're describing uh, an, uh, an assumption in your model of stability of voter decision making once it's made. In other words, there's less difference between uh, between now and three months from now in your model than there may be in his, because you've got this built in assumption that once voters have made up their mind, they're really very unlikely to change them. And so mm -hmm. my question is, does does it does that imply that basically the models are actually less different than it looks? Um, it's just that he's building in more uncertainty given the amount of time between now mm -hmm. and the election than you are. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're assuming things aren't going to change very much between now and November. He's building in a lot of possibility for change. And that's really the difference right there. It seems like I'm being it, reductionist, but intentionally so. Uh, that's not too reductionist, actually. I, th I think by election day, our models will basically say the same thing, uh, because 
Well, again, um, there's there's some extra uncertainty, right? Okay, well, let's be reductionist. Um, yes, uh, the 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 bulk of the difference seems to come from us thinking that uh, changes in the election are bound basically to about ten points of where they are today, and Nate thinking that that's much much higher from what I can gather to be closer to like twenty or maybe maybe even more. Um, now I think that that is like the right way to go go about it if it's. 1988, um, and also if if you're a believer that um, a, a rebound in the economy will help Trump, or that a vaccine will shore up his electoral prospects, but frankly, I don't think we have a whole lot of evidence that that's true. Um, when the economy collapsed, our reading, if you if you pre yeah, let me put it this way: if you predict what's going to happen in November only because of of economic growth. In the beginning of January, it had Trump winning 50% of the vote. And in March, it had Trump winning like 40% of the vote. Um, and that's because, again, there are weaknesses in, in predicting electoral results uh, with the economy. Um, I don't think it, he would have only won 40% um, because, again, polarization is a thing that exists um, and, and constraints behavior. Um, but over that same time period, the polls only moved three points, not 10. Um, so it, it's unclear to me that if the economy gets better, then Trump is going to gain a lot of ground in the polls. Maybe he would gain uh, a third of whatever movement in the economy implies. Similarly, the uh, news, the, the second wave of the pandemic, or I guess uh, an intermediate first wave, um, um, didn't seem to impact the polls that much at all. Our model has the race going from 55% in uh, early July to um, 54 and a half today, even though deaths have increased um, by uh, multiplicatively. Um, so, so that doesn't seem to be a, a sound assumption in the model. Now, there's a this warrants caution and uncertainty, right? Like we're talking about the future, we're theorizing about behavior, there's gotta be some room that we're wrong, right? And our, and our model does have some room for this, but um, there's probably some disagreement between Nate and our model in that um, we can disagree about the uncertainty in these assumptions, um, but the biggest difference seems to be that we are making the assumption that behavior is constrained um, and Nate's not. That's interesting. All right. So let, before we turn to questions from the audience, I just want to ask uh, about how we know who's, how we measure model performance over time. So in a normal uh, situation that you would model, it's a situation that arises repeatedly. Sports, for example, to cite where Nate comes from. So you measure whose model is better by who makes more money betting based on their model, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a very high N, 162 games in a baseball season, you know, many teams playing many other teams over and over and over again. Each baseball player is at bat many, many, many times, right? And so the model has a lot of chances to perform well or to suck. And you can actually compare the, you know, 71% likelihood that Biden wins to your 90% likelihood that Biden wins uh, uh, repeatedly over time and see whether he wins, you know, 29%, 71% or 90%, right? Um, you can't do that with presidential elections. Each of them is basically a black swan event. If Biden, if and by your own account, the likelihoods are on the on of your models converging over the next few months is very <laughs> high. So we're going to end up in a situation where let's hypothesize you're five to seven points apart, and you're both on the side that ends up predicting a higher than 50% likelihood of the thing that happening happening, 
which is, of course, not what happened in 2016, but is generally what happens, right? Mm -hmm. People say there's a 70% chance of Democrats taking the House, but only a 42% chance of the Democrats taking the Senate. And the Democrats don't take the Senate, and they were a 20% chance, right? And then they do take the House. And so everybody says, yeah, our model got it right. My question is, what's the right way, given that we're not going to have iterative performances of this presidential election and the next presidential election is going to be sufficiently different from this one that you're mm. going to change your model, right? You're not going to have a COVID variable in the next presidential election. Um, so what is the right way to other than Twitter arguments, given that you're probably both likely to be proven right? Both of your models are likely to be vindicated they're likely to end up saying something pretty similar at the end of the day. How do we know whether your model can beat up Nate's or whether Nate's model can beat up yours? <laughs> well, uh, beating up, uh, it's interesting to think about statistical models physically attacking each other. We uh, uh, put them, <laughs> put boxing gloves on them, uh -huh. you put them in well, the cage and I guess, we'll see I guess, whose model wins. I guess I would bet on our model because um, we, I think we have more computing power behind it. It's just a lot harder problems to solve. Anyway, um, there, yeah, so there are a few ways that you can measure performance of a statistical model. Um, one way is a, uh, uh, is to capture the accuracy of all 50 probabilistic scores that you assign for 51 to each state, not just the aggregate, you know, Biden has an X percent chance of winning the electoral college. Um, and, and and if you assign closer odds to all those states and you're right, um, then your model is, or, 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 and your Breyer score is better than your model is presumed to be better. And a second way is to see how well uh, your model predicts the margin of victory in each state and whether or not the result is in your confidence interval or, or your, your Bayesian uncertainty of all interval for that state. Um, and on election day, we can use both these techniques to have some suggestive evidence at who's better. Uh, but, you know, that's not a 100% guarantee. And then um, I'll also say we can do these things for our predictions now. So although there is a large disagreement between Nate um, and our prediction for what might happen in November, uh, we can, after we get the results, figure out who was closer to the eventual result today. And if it turns out that assuming the race, or making the statistical assumption, not just assuming that the race um, shouldn't move, you know, more than 10 points was wrong, uh, those, those scores would reveal that error. And conversely, if thinking that the race could move by 20 or 30 points was too much uncertainty, we'll again have a rough idea of whether or not that's right. We can't know for sure until we, you know, until we have a million elections in the United States. Um, you know, but, but we can have a, a pretty good idea. I just want to observe before we start going to audience questions that uh, we are seeing a uh, increasing percentage of questions by a decreasing percentage of audience members. And this is not a reflection on the awesome people who are posing questions. It's a reflection on all of the rest of you who have stopped posing questions and refuse to be raptured in when I bring you in. So with that as caveat, John Bordeaux, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I, I will get some, um, I'll get some heat from Maggie on appearing on a mantle. I promise I never would. Uh, <laughs> uh, real quick, the New York Times gave um, some oxygen to the Lichtman prediction model. It was a very clickbaity thing. You had to watch the whole video to get the answer. Can you briefly cover the veracity or usefulness of that, I'll say method, um, that approach? Um, as, as briefly as possible, and perhaps not too empirically, I would not trust those predictions. Um, and, and that's actually we can talk about this statistically if we want. So Lichtman purports to predict, I guess, the last hundred years of elections with uh, 13 keys, which in a model building context we can describe as variables. And I think if you have if you talk to any predictive modeler and said we're going to predict a hundred things with 13 different variables, they would look at you like you're crazy because you're going to overfit your model because there just aren't 
enough observations to fit that many factors in the election. Like at that point, you're basically coming up um, or, or less hundred years of elections. So, you know, really it's only uh, like 25. Um, uh, but yeah, at, at that point, you're like coming up with a new factor to explain every different outcome. Um, and, 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 you know, if he, if, if like in 1992, you miss Bill Clinton, so you think I'm going to add a variable for third parties, then after fact, you're like, oh, we could have predicted this election. Um, I don't think that that's, you know, super accurate. Uh, and again, statistically, if you take the association between all the keys and the actual election results, uh, you're going to get a much worse relationship than if you use like almost any other, uh, variable. So. Yeah, I just I just wouldn't put too much stock in it. Pre Niels Bohr said predictions are very difficult, particularly about the future. A quote that is sometimes attributed to Yogi Berra. Um, but I just want to say predicting the past is a mugs game. Um, uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Hey, Elliot. Uh, I think you're an R user. I just wanted to know what packages you use for Bayesian stuff. We write the model in Stan, so we use R Stan. Um, not quite the nerdy question. Um, we, I mean, there's like tons of, you know, there's tons of data processing stuff that happens on the back end. You should email me. We'll have a conversation. Daniel, your turn. Um, so my question is on the premise that people struggle interpreting probabilities, and I'm just wondering how you think the media in general could do a better job of communicating what the uncertainties associated with your and, say, Silver's model would be. Um, I've been emphasizing to people that would you get on an airplane if it had a one in a hundred odds of crashing? It's still a pretty high probability of crashing to get on an airplane if it's a one in a hundred odds. And so 30 in a hundred odds for Trump winning is still pretty high. I'm just wondering how you would communicate the uncertainties in the model. So I think that describing probabilities with numbers in text form is like not super helpful to people for the reason that you're saying. People, I guess, don't people tend to round up probabilities so from like 80 or 90 all the way to 100 um and, and you know it's like hard to convey to people that uh what we're doing is basically figuring out what ha would happen if you ran the election nine you know 100 or a thousand different times and you know obviously we don't have a thousand elections so that number is not very useful i think what you want to do is describe the likelihood of the event so at the top of our forecast now we say that things are likely or very likely or uncertain to occur. And I think that that is the better way to describe to people what's really going on. You know, there are also some ways to measure this. Like if you tell people that something's likely to happen, they tell you roughly that they think it would happen 70 to 80% of the time. So that's why we categorize things in 70 to 80% as likely, because we know that that's roughly something that people can get their, uh, their hands around. Um, but instead of using numbers, I think we prefer to, to display things visually. So we have a number of ways on our website that, that we show people that, uh, you know, that we try to visualize probabilities for people. Uh, one way is to just, ha is, is what people call a risk theater. Um, you could imagine that in a movie theater, there are like a hundred seats and you can light up each seat in proportion to how likely you think it is to occur. And that allows people to really see on a piece of paper or, or I guess on a computer screen, like a, a ratio of colors to really feel. Like I, I think telling someone th telling someone something that's 70% likely to happen is much different than showing them like a piece of paper where 30% of the paper is red. Uh, I, you know, you would you would really be like, okay, this is a real thing that's going to happen instead of, oh, this is the thing that's favored to happen, so it's going to happen. David, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thinking about October surprises, are there always October surprises, and how does your model deal with the challenge of an October surprise? I don't know if there are always October surprises. If there were, I guess we wouldn't call them surprises, right? We would just call them October. Um, 
but you know they they do happen. Um, technically speaking, the model captures their chance of changing the race based off of how much they've changed the polls in the past. So like I mentioned, our model thinks that the polls won't change more than 10% or 10 percentage points over the next um, 81 days. Um, and that's based off of how much they've changed in the past. Um, and I guess technically the relationship between more polarization and the smaller impact of October surprises. Uh, but there's an obvious caveat here, which is that if you have, a, if you have an October surprise that uh, causes a larger change in the race than you've ever observed before, the model's not going to see it. So I don't know exactly what that would be, given the past October surprises have been pretty, I don't know, I guess I would call them severe. Like, the technical definition of the Comey event was an FBI director taking completely unprecedented action against a political candidate that's a technically an unprecedented event. Um, the October surprises... Uh, and McCain, you know, in 2008, you technically had a September surprise with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So that's, you know, like, that's also captured in the forecast. So I don't know what those more severe one would be. You can probably think of some extreme election meddling outcomes, I guess. Um, or a vaccine would be an example of an unforeseen October surprise. So. Or foreign policy events are kind of the classic in people's minds when you think of an October surprise, you think of like a foreign policy crisis. But I also think that the other thing about October surprises is that they're they're very different in character from one another. Like, you know, a, a, an October surprise that reinforces the the existing. So the Lehman Brothers collapse. Obama was ahead before it happened. Right. And so an October surprise that that reifies the existing race um, is a very different thing from an October surprise that tends to push against, you know, it's a close race, but Clinton is ahead and then Comey does his thing and Trump wins, you know, you end up with an attribution of the result that is uh, that you don't get the other direction. Michael, what's on your mind? Well, so you sort of touched on this a little bit, I guess, already, but I was curious to know, you talked a little bit about sort of validating your models against your know, previous races. And I was curious to know, like, to what extent do you, are you able to run your models longitudinally, right? Do you take the same model and kind of try and apply it to different elections over time um, and then sort of refine it? Or is this basically sort of ab initio each election, you kind of make a new set of parameters based on the particular things that are going on at that moment in time? Um, and, and sort of basically to the extent, are you able to kind of carry any knowledge over from previous attempts? So the back to this back testing, this model validation, it's probably a it's probably somewhere between the two scenarios you've described. Um, we take the same uh, with like the same statistical script, the same uh, I guess you know the same like blueprint for the house of the model and apply it to all the elections. But some years have uh, different factors that cause uncertainty to be high, uncertainty to be higher or lower. I guess similarly how if you're building a spec neighborhood, some people want different colors of paint in their house. I don't know, I'm not a builder. Um, uh, uh, so, so, the, so the framework is the same, but we, we specifically tell the model that in some years you need different parameters if there's a third party candidate running, if there's an unprecedented economic collapse like this year. So the, um, uh, the, the model script will run you know, its predictions for every year, and we don't mess with those specific parameters. We never assign specific parameters to like variance or how much the approval rating should impact the predict the, the approval rating of the president should impact the prediction. Uh, but we do tell the model like, hey, if uh, the economic reading is high, if the observed volatility in the economy is higher, then figure out the best optimal uh, uh, in increase in uncertainty for the election. Um, that means that you don't miss the outcome in huge, uh, hugely uncertain years. Uh, but yeah, but I want to be really clear, like when we're testing the model, we're never introducing entirely new factors into the model. We're never giving it specific values for how to solve the problem optimally. We're only telling it, 
hey, in this year, you might want to consider this extra thing. Jackson, uh, you get the penultimate question. Okay. okay. I was just wondering what you thought of models like Predict It or other betting markets to have a prediction or if they had any power. So I wouldn't call a prediction market a model for the, for the first part just because, you know, you're not like, you know, formally asserting that certain factors should explain outcomes. That's just, you know, pedantic, whatever. Um, uh, what, I, what do I think about prediction markets? Well, they seem not to be able to predict elections super well ahead of time. Their Breyer scores are typically lower than the best forecasts. Um, it, this, is, this is notably different than things like um, the, you know, the Mata sports bookies uh, who do a pretty good job of aggregating information about contests and assigning uh, pretty good odds. Um, I don't, I, you know, I really don't put a whole lot of stock and predict it in particular. If you go to their website and you look at the prediction, uh, the prediction map, um, just do it now to see if anything's changed before I speak. Um, yeah, Joe, Joe Biden is favored in electoral in states with worth 324 electoral votes, but they give him only a, a less than a 60% chance of winning. Um, like it doesn't seem like that's very reconcilable, and and not because, you know, you think oh he has enough um, electoral votes to win, but because if you create a model uh, to predict the election and then you like filter it to scenarios with the same odds as predict it, you don't get sixty percent. So they're adding a lot of other information and it's really unclear what type of information they're adding now, like in the past they've seemed to have um a bias toward candidates that like white men would favor so maybe there's some sort of gap in the crowdsourcing of knowledge here the sort of wisdom of the crowds might not be so wise the wisdom of the male crowd the, the wisdom of the scottish teens i guess is what uh, yeah. 538 would say um, but but then there's also like some just some wonky stuff. Um, they had Hillary Clinton winning, or, or you know, with a sizable chance of winning the 2020 Democratic primary for quite a while. And you know, even when like Andrew Cuomo during the coronavirus um, was uh, um, you know in the news all the time, predicted thought that he might have a pretty good shot of becoming the Democratic nominee. When I, I think if you Look at the history of nominations after Joe Biden had a lock on the nomination, giving Andrew Cuomo a 10% chance of winning the contest was pretty foolhardy. So, so right, so there's two things, right? It doesn't seem like things add up, and they're just like weird bets all over the place that indicate that funky stuff's happening. Can I just also add to that that the stock market is a really bad short term predictor of anything? It's a really good long-term predictor of all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, the reason it's so volatile is that it's actually not very good at figuring out what the price of X is going to be tomorrow. And, you know, crowds are not that good at that. Um, Zach Bliss, you get the last question. Okay, that is kind of bad because I forgot what I meant by that question a little bit, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Well, just <laughs> reformulate it as suits your heart now. Yeah. So you're, even you cannot predict your question 45 that's, minutes from now. That's very true. A crowd would be even worse at it. Actually, I'm just going to be a markup chain of myself right now and just speak random words. But Let's see. So our poll, how to what degree are polls and elections different things or just the same thing by different rules? Uh, that's a good question. I think I know what you mean. Um, so, and so I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, but like, some people think, oh, it's just a poll. It's not, it's not like it's a thing that matters. It's, but it's, it's just kind of the same thing, but we're doing it in a slightly different methodology, it feels like. Why is it like less real? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, an election has uh, has an institutionalized set of rules to determine outcomes, whereas polls uh, are just measurements of what the population is thinking. Now, both are like measuring what the population is thinking. One 
does a more accurate job of that because it happens to determine the result. But uh, yeah, I mean, the poll pollsters often make this a similar argument, I guess, which is that uh, polls actually do what elections or democracies port purport to do, which is to translate what the people want into um, into governmental outcomes or to, to truly measure what people want out of their government without conditionalizing on them going or conditioning on them to actually go to the polls, which is what an election does. Um, I, I, you're, you're, you're sort of making a very like George Gallupian argument about, about, about democracy, which is that you know, polls, are, um, polls are better measurements of the public will, which I think probably has, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that, frankly. So our poll of the day is in the field. It's the cage match between the models. Uh, whose model do you have the most confidence in? The Economist, 538, other or none? So far, none is ahead. Yes. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we do not yet have a full uh, complement of the universe of voters. Um, <laughs> Elliot, this has been a, a, a great pleasure. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I actually learned a lot. And I know exactly, other than Biden's chance of winning in the models, what I will be looking for over the next few weeks, which is whether, in fact, you and the 538 model converge, mm. or whether there is some more fundamental difference uh, uh, that is um, accounting for the uh, apparently large variance uh, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, happy to do it. My pleasure. So doing the sign off without Kate is weird, guys. Uh, so I'm just going to do it. Uh, I don't remember who we have tomorrow. Tomorrow was uh, 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 Kate's guest. Uh, and I can't remember uh, exactly who it was. So I'm just not going to tell you now. Um, and, uh, you know, but we will be back. Um, 23 hours and 58 minutes from now. And until then, we don't have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, you can still make models of highly unpredictable events. And when you correctly predict uh, the likelihood of that event, you can fight over whose model was more right. And that seems like a very worthwhile thing to do. Uh, none won the... Uh, uh, the vote, um, but The Economist and 538's models uh, came within a vote of each other. 538 beat The Economist by 9 to 8. So uh, given that The Economist model is the upstart, uh, the new, oh, it's now 9 to 9. Uh, 10 to 9 Economist. This is not, I'm not influencing the vote here at all. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whose model uh, uh, creates the most uh, accurate approximation of reality over time. Until tomorrow, we will see you then.